Thank you. So welcome to World Lecture 2. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Jennifer Chase, the world speaker this year. She's currently the Associate Provost at Berkeley in the Division of Computing, Data Science and Society. Um, she's also the Dean of the School of Information and she holds appointments in four different departments, ECS, Math, Statistics and the School of Information, which just demonstrates her amazing breadth. She was at Microsoft Research for over 20 years before she moved to Berkeley. Um, she's very well known for her work um, in theoretical computer science and networks, for especially probability on graphs. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of the Arts and Science. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, ACM, the main computer science society, and the American Mathematical Society. She received multiple awards, including the Anita Borg Institute um, of Women um, Vision Award, that's um, a special one, and the Siam John von Neumann Prize. And um, she's worked on many applications as well as theory, especially in recent years on machine learning. Um, her applications include cancer immunotherapy, um, ethical decision making, and climate change. And today she will tell us about modeling and estimating large sparse networks. Go ahead, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, well, I, let me just I'm, say one more thing to yes. the attendees. If you have questions, sorry, I missed that. Please feel mm -hmm. free to type them into either the Zoom chat in the Zoom webinar or in the JSM platform chat. We will be monitoring both places for questions. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to assume that most of you were here for the first lecture, so I'm going to refer back to it. Although, in a sense, we're going to be starting from scratch with a view which was based on one piece of that first lecture. And uh, I was just telling Lisa that that was more of a probabilistic uh, approach. And this is going to be, there, there were elements of statistics, we're going to pick up on those and expand on those in this lecture. So here is an alternative approach to graph limits, okay? Instead of using subgraph counts, you know, we were counting, uh, counting homomorphisms or the you know, the, the, the density of certain subgraphs and asking that those converge or free energies and statistical physics models, that was right convergence. Here, we're gonna use sampling as the basis for graph limits. And it was only after doing graph limits for a long time that we realized that sampling could really give us a, a very nice way of getting a representation theorem out of this. So we have a large combinatorial structure. You know, I'm usually thinking of a graph, but it need not be a graph. We have a sampling procedure, and that sampling is, and it can be many different kinds, will give us a small random object, F of GN, this combinatorial structure. And we are going to say that GN is convergent if this sample, if all these samples that I take converge in distribution. So I'll get some distribution, B of F. And if we have enough symmetries, B is going to have a compact representation, for example, in terms of a graph on. Okay, so I am going to start with a primer on exchangeability, going back to, you know, kind of first year statistics um, and talking about um, and talking about things that we learn there, but we might not have realized how incredible they actually are. Um, and then I'm going to reformulate left convergence for dense graphs in terms of sampling. We do sampling convergence. Then we're going to look at a structure called a graph X, which is kind of a generalization of a graph on. And we will show that it's the completion of the space of sparse graphs. We're going to prove a graph X representation theorem 
telling us that yes, indeed, there is a compact representation of the distribution of sparse graphs of divergent degree. And then we're gonna do sampling convergence for the configuration model, which is a very nice model that has more, uh, uh, more, um, more independence than the standard uh, graph models that we look at. Um, and then we will look at the question of um, the question of uniqueness or identifiability of the representative. And you may remember if you were in the last talk that um, the graphon was the representative, was the, was the compact representation of the limit. Um, and I said that it was, um, it was unique up to measure preserving bijections. So while an array had uh, the set, um, you, you had to mod out by the set of permutation symmetries, the graph on you had to mod out by the set of measure preserving bijections. Interestingly, that work was done, and by the way, you're gonna see B and C in most of these references. B is Christian Borgs, one of the Cs is me. Um, and that was done with the, the two of us and Lotsi Lovas in around 2010. And about a decade later, to do the generalization of that for graph X's and for this representation theorem, uh, we were joined. So Christian and I were joined by Henry Cohn and Lotsi Lovas Jr. And it was our present to Lotsi Lovas Sr. when he turned 70. It was 108, 110-page paper on uniqueness and identifiability. So only a mathematician would like that present. <laughs> okay, so a primer on exchangeability. So now we're going to go back to very elementary statistics. Okay, we are going to look at exchangeable sequences. And an infinite sequence, x1 up to you know, whatever, I mean, XK and, and beyond is exchangeable if for any finite N and any distinct finite sequences, I, I went up through IN and J went up through JN, the two subsequences, which are the relevant subsequences from those distinct finite sequences have the same joint probability distribution, okay? So they're not independent, but they're exchangeable. Now note that if an identically distributed sequence is independent, then clearly it's exchangeable, but not vice versa. So the pull you earn, for example, um, you know, what, what happens depends on which ball I, or which pair of socks or whatever I pulled out the first time, okay, and the second time. Um, however, Definetti, had an incredible insight, which we all learn about, but as you think about generalizing it, it was a really deep insight. He said that exchangeable sequences, though not independent, are not that far from independent, okay? In particular, when conditioned on a parameter, which when we think about it in a broader context, is a random variable measurable with respect to the sigma algebra and infinity on these sequences, they are actually independent. So it's conditionally independent conditioned on this parameter. So here, an infinite sequence, and don't just think of Paul Yuzern, is exchangeable, but you can think of it if, if you want. <laughs> if and only if there exists a probability measure on zero one, such that this sequence can be generated in the following way. I'm gonna choose a P, in zero one, according to this measure mu. And I'm going to choose Xi, Iid, Bernoulli in zero one with parameter P. So conditioned on this parameter P, these have become Iid, Bernoulli. And what P is, is it's the probability that X one equals one, which is one minus the probability it equals zero. I can also represent 
P as um, the, the limit as n tends to infinity of one over n times the number of um, the, the number of i's less than n for which xi is equal to one. This looks totally elementary. Jennifer, but, yes. Sorry, there's a clarifying question hmm. in the chat. Do i and j need to be increasing or non-decreasing sequences? Do i and j, I think it's from just the 30 seconds ago, do i and j need to be increasing or non-decreasing sequences? Yeah, probably yes, but yes, sorry. But the density P, because it needs to be projective, basically. <laughs> um, the density P here, okay, this, this P quantity is measurable with respect, I mean, it's just a number, but it's measurable with respect to the sigma algebra at infinity. Because I'm looking as n tends to infinity, if I change any finite number, it's not gonna change P. So it's measurable with respect to the sigma algebra at infinity, okay? Which is not the way you first learned about Definetti probably. Okay, so is there an analog of Definetti for arrays corresponding to dense graphs, okay? And the answer is yes, and that's the Aldous-Hoover theorem proved independently by Hoover and Aldous in 79 and 81. So basically simultaneously. And then how about arrays corresponding to sparse graphs with divergent degrees? And that's the second motivation for this graph on process that we started to talk about in the first lecture where we laid down these points, we saw what they connected to, you know, but I, in, in order to get a limit out of that, I had to put on certain regularity conditions, we're gonna remove those here. Okay, and if you don't know that, it doesn't matter, we're gonna see it all again. Okay, so now let's look at exchangeable arrays. Okay, these correspond to dense graphs, right? Because it's the adjacency matrix of the graph. So I have an infinite array and it's jointly exchangeable if for any finite n and any permutation on a sequence of n distinct indices. So I permute some of them on both sides, okay? They have the same joint probability distribution. And certainly when we, when we think of these graphs that we get, okay, they, you know, we, we can think of them as jointly exchangeable. So an infinite random graph is exchangeable if the distribution of its adjacency matrix is invariant under any finite permutation of its vertices. So the question is, how simply can such a distribution be generated? How, how can it be generated? And is it enough to have a strict analog of Definetti? In other words, is there some parameter, which is a random variable measurable with respect to the sigma algebra and infinity? And is that enough to specify it? And the answer is no, even for dense graphs, there's a much larger space that characterizes exchangeable arrays. This is what Aldous Hoover did. Now I'm gonna give it to you in a language that sounds much more like the graphon language which of course wasn't there at the time. So this is a reformulation of Aldous Hoover, okay? But Aldous Hoover could be viewed as saying, and it was actually uh, uh, Percy Diaconis and Svante Janssen and independently Tim Austin, who kind of thought of this way of looking at the Aldous Hoover theorem, um, an infinite in, in terms of graphons, and inf although David Aldous may have known this at the time, an infinite array is jointly exchangeable if and only if there's a probability measure mu on equivalence classes of dense graphons. And you remember when I told you what are the equivalence classes, there are things up to a measure preserving by bijection of the space, such that AIJ can be generated as, as follows. 
choose a possibly random element of the equivalence class. And by the way, since we're only choosing an element of the equivalence class, we could replace the smaller feature space 01 by a general feature space. And those feature spaces you might remember from last time, you know, I, I'm a, a point I'm generated with my features, with my height, with my weight, with my gender identification, with my you know, uh, years of education and so on. And Buddy is generated in some other way and Lisa is generated with some other features, okay? So we're all being generated. I choose a W from this equivalence class according to mu. And then I have this uniformly random sequence and I'm gonna connect I and J independently with probability W. And that's what's important. Just like once I chose the P, I could then do Bernoulli on the sequence. So while Diffinetti's theorem says that infinite exchangeable sequences are just conditionally independent Bernoulli sequences with random parameter P, okay, condition on the parameter, the Aldous Hoover theorem says that infinite jointly exchangeable arrays are just random dense graphons. So the representation is the, the compact representation is the graph. Aldous Hoover was not, and I'll even come back to this history later, and I'll come back to, all, to, to Aldous Hoover a few minutes later, but it was not expressed in the language of graphons since it was done 25 years before dense graphons were, were introduced. And as stated here, it includes, you, you have to talk about the uniqueness of the representative. And that really depends on some work that Christian Borgs and I did with Latsi Lovas, 2010. Okay, so now we're gonna look at sparse graphons and we're gonna ask, are they associated with some exchangeable infinite processes, okay? Before we had sequences and we had arrays, and we're now asking processes in the same way that Bernoulli sequences are associated with infinite exchangeable sequences and graphons are associated with infinite jointly exchangeable arrays. And the answer last time, if you were there, we did a rescaling of the graphon if the, if if it was sparse and the density was going to zero. We did a rescaling where we just divided through by this density that was going to zero. We renormalized the, the height. So it doesn't work there. But yes, if we define a projective sparse graphon process on an infinite sigma finite measure space and its corresponding edge process, so I didn't give you the corresponding edge process officially last time, but I did tell you a little bit about this and I'll do it again. This was found simultaneously in 2015-16 by me, Christian Borgs, Henry Cohn, and Nina Holden, who was a grad student at the time, and by um, Roy and Victor Veitch. Um, and it was inspired by special cases studied uh, uh, studied in 2014 uh, uh, by Caron and Fox. And they were also um, looking at general theorems of Kallenberg on measure spaces. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about an exchangeable edge process and measure. So I'm gonna consider a locally finite edge process. What do I mean by locally finite? I mean that in any finite area, I'm only going to have um, a finite number of points, okay? And this is going to ensure that the measure that we end up getting later is sigma finite. And I'm going to call this an edge process, but I'm going to think of it on as on time cross time. R plus cross R plus, okay? So I'm gonna view this as the adjacency matrix of an infinite graph with its vertices labeled by time, okay? So, um, you know, 
in this picture we looked at before, we'll look at again, I was generated at time one, okay? And Buddy was generated at time two, and Ben was generated at time three, and Buddy, and, and uh, Lisa was generated at time four, okay? Um, and so what, what happens is that like my edge with Lisa can't be generated until time four at the earliest, okay? Um, and so we're going to have, I, a, along the bottom of this, I think of this little picture here as time cross time. And when the edge appears and, and the individuals who, are, who have their features, okay, or their full set of features, are points along here, okay, I'm drawing it in one dimension, but it's not one dimension for the features, but this is the time dimension. When they get connected to each other, that is going to be where that point uh, appears there, okay? So if um, the individual with their set of features uh, is um, generated at time 27 and another um, and another um, in individual is generated at time 35 and they happen to connect, then I'm going to put a point mass in atom at the point on this time cross time axis corresponding to 27 along the x-axis and uh, 35 along the y-axis, okay? And not surprisingly, it gets much sparser as we go out because there are less opportunities to connect to the newer vertices. And I say that the measure PG, which is a set of point masses, is jointly exchangeable if its distribution is invariant under finite interval permutations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a finite number of equal length intervals of time, let's say, you know, time five to seven and time 12 to uh, 13 and so on. And I'm going to jointly permute the corresponding rows and columns there. So I'm going to take those times and I'm going to permute them. Okay, all possible per permutations. So this is kind of hard to understand. We're looking at time cross time. Okay, now I'm going to go back to dense graphons, which are easy. We just went from definite up to measures. Now we're just going to go back to dense graphons. And instead of asking for what are the subgraph frequencies, which was our local way of measuring a dense graph, and asking that the edge density, the triangle density, the four cycle density, the Peter graph density, the Peterson graph density all converge. I'm going to do something different, more statistical. I'm going to test a large graph from the left by choosing my points. Okay, so these are my points on the graph, um, but I'm going to choose k of them uniformly at random. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to output the induced subgraph, okay, which I'm going to call sample sub k of g, the graph with vertex at k and the induced edges, okay, the ones that happen to be there, I, I put in, okay. I, if I do it again, I'm going to get a different set of edges and a different set of, of you know, so, so a different induced graph and a different induced graph. And a sequence of dense graphs GN, so now I'm going to sample things along my sequence, is called left convergent if the distribution of these samples that I generate, I take my graph at time 27, and I take K vertices at random, uniformly at random from it, and I connect the ones that are actually connected in the graph to get the induced subgraph, if that converges, if that distribution converges for all K. And this is, this definition is equivalent to subgraph convergence because these are basically samples that generate the subgraph. So the question is, what is the limit of this? Well, now, instead of saying the limit is, you know, the limit of the, 
of the set of subgraph densities or the limit of the set of something else. The limit is a set of probability distributions on finite graphs. I have graphs in a sequence, you know, G, GK and so on, up through G, GN, up through whatever, um, I mean, to, to infinity. And, um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sample K random points and the induced subgraph at each step along the way. And if those distributions, different realizations, different induced subgraphs all on K vertices converge, then I'm gonna say, well, my collection, what I get is a collection of probability distributions on finite graphs. That's a, you know, that's not that useful, <laughs> but note that it's a projective collection of probability distributions, okay? Because if I look at GK, it, and I, and I take off the last point that I picked up in my sample, then GK minus one is the induced subgraph. So it's projected. And because it's projected by Kolmogorov, I get an infinite random graph, okay? Because each one is a subset of the later ones, I'm gonna get an infinite random graph. You know, I have the monotonicity that I need by, um, uh, by Kolmogorov. Okay, so what is an infinite random graph? It's an infinite random array, the edges of the graph. So what are the properties of this? Well, exchangeability, you know, per permutation invariance of the distribution for all permutations, because we started out with it being, you know, these, these, these were just the, the, the permutations of the vertices of the graph. And another property, which we didn't think much about before, which is extremality. It turns out the probability distribution of this set of, you know, this of, of, of these random arrays cannot be written as a non-trivial convex combination, combination to different probability distributions, okay? And this follows from the fact that the subarrays um, from, the, from K cross K, from the K sampling and the subarray from, um, you know, uh, K plus one <laughs> up to um, N are independent by the sampling process. So, so this is very nice. So now we say the limit of a left convergent sequence of dense graphs is an extremal exchangeable array. Okay, and that might be better than a collection of probability distributions on these samples, but still it's not that compact. And now we get back to all this and Hoover, who said, if A, so now you're thinking of, of A as, um, you know, uh, time cross, as something on time cross time, because the points are labeled by when they were generated. If this is a symmetric ex a extremal exchangeable array. So what did we have before for Diffinetti? For Diffinetti, we had a, um, an exchangeable sequence, okay. Here we have an extremal exchangeable array then there exists a symmetric function such that A can be generated by first choosing X1, X2 uniformly at random, and then choosing the entries of AIJ Bernoulli um, based on this function, okay? So just like Diffinetti says, I have a random, I have a parameter, which is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra at infinity, this parameter P, Aldous and Hoover say the analog for arrays rather than for um, sequences is that I have a function that's as compact as we can make it. 
So the limit of left convergence sequence is a symmetric W and it's called a graphon. Okay, so there's history here. The notion of left convergence as subgraph counts was first introduced in this, you know, in the kind of the first definitions of graph limits with Christian Borgs, May, Lati Lovash, Verashosh, and Kadi Vestragambi. The existence of the limiting graphon for a left convergent sequence of dense graphs in the first paper is actually done before the second, but, um, you know, but they appeared uh, similar times because this is much shorter. Uh, Lovash and Balash Sagetti did this via a, a regularity lemma um, and martingale convergence. Okay, we coined the term graph on in a later paper with the Gang of Five. And independently, Diakonis and Janssen and Tim Austin in 2008 said, hey, you don't need to use regularity and martingale convergence. This is just obvious from Aldous Hoover. It follows immediately from Aldous Hoover. And, um, but it was not so immediate. They had papers on it. And this new explicit formulation of left convergence in terms of sampling, which makes this argument almost automatic as I just gave it to you, was in work that Christian Borgs and I did with Henry Cohn and Victor Veitch. Okay, so we now have looked at exchangeable arrays. Uh, um, it, first at um, exchangeable sequences, then at jointly exchangeable arrays. Now, at which correspond to dense graphs. Now I want to define graph limits via sampling process but for sparse graphs of unbounded degree, okay, which are much more difficult because of the scaling, they just turn out to be trivial if you don't watch out. So the expected number of edges in this is, of course, k choose two times rho of g. I choose k points, some probability, and then, and then, or at, at, at random, um, in zero one, whatever I want to do, and then, but my measuring need not be uniformly random. And I, I have um, the density of edges in G because, uh, you know, I, I, it, my different ones are going to have different numbers of edges, but they're, they're going to be in expectation, the density of the underlying graph. And for sparse graphs, this converges to the empty graph, okay? Not very useful. Because for sparse graphs, rho of g is going to zero. So the idea we had was to find a sampling procedure so that k choose two grows like one over rho. So that that expression up there, k times k minus one over two, rho of g will not go to zero. How do we do that? Well, let's define something which we call Poisson sampling. Okay, we also have Bernoulli sampling and other things, but let's just talk about Poisson sampling. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a Poisson process, okay? Um, so I'm gonna be choosing these points. What intensity do I wanna use? Remember, P is gonna be my sample density. And if I sample too much, the graph is just going to go to zero. Okay. Um, so what I wanted, no, I have to sample more, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I have to sample, yeah, have to sample less as it goes out, right? Like one over n. And so what I'm going to do, just looking, looking up there, how much do I have to sample? Well, let's just look at this. I I want P to be T over square root of two, don't worry about that, the number of edges, okay? And I'm gonna output the induced subgraph after deleting all the isolated vertices. So what does this give me? I'm gonna, in, in, um, in expectation, I'm gonna sum over all of the edges. So this is, um, this is just the number E of G, the number of edges. 
uh, I'm, I'm sampling and for each edge, I have to get its two endpoints, P. So it's P squared, V squared. Okay, because how many, how many, uh, uh, how, how many endpoints do I have? Okay, if I plug this in and use what P is, and just, you know, do the, 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 um, the arithmetic, then I find that the expected number of edges is uniform in row. Okay, it's T squared over two uniformly in row. Okay, so even if the density of the underlying graph is going to zero, okay, even if the number, the number of edges in the graph divided by um, n squared is going to zero, I'm still going to get something uniform here in row. Okay, so we say a sequence of graphs is sampling convergent if for all t, this Poisson process of generating this sequence of graphs converges in distribution, okay? Just like before, we're getting a distribution first, which is not a compact representation. We're getting a distribution. We're like in that first graph, we have some B of F, okay? And F here is this whole process of, of Poisson sampling from a graph. By compactness, of course, any sequence has a um, has a, a subsequence that is sampling convergent. Not too helpful yet. What is the limit? Well, the limit clearly is just a process of unlabeled graphs. I'm generating these 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 graphs here. Okay, is there an analog of the Aldous Hoover theorem which gives a more compact description of this process, okay? Because Aldous Hoover, I got these big, these infinite exchangeable arrays, and I ended up being able to represent them by a function. Here, I'm asking, I, I have a process of unlabeled graphs, okay? Can I represent them more compactly? And the preliminary answer <clears throat> is that we're going to extend the definition of Gravhans over probability spaces to Gravhans over sigma finite measure spaces and use the Poisson process to define the Gravhan process. So here we go. We actually had already talked about this with the stretching of the underlying metric before. So this really began with a uh, uh, Caron and Fox in 2014, um, they were looking at very specific kinds of like product processes. So this generalizes that. So we fix a sigma finite measure space and a graph on, okay. Graph on is just the probability that somebody with this whole set of features, somebody I'm a point in, in um, I'm a point in omega and Lisa is a point in omega. We ha both have our sets of features and we're just gonna connect with that probability. That's our process, okay? So <clears throat> how do we do this? We, we have the points of this, uh, of this Poisson process with density T mu. We connect I and J with probability W of Xi, Xj, remove the isolated vertices and get a finite graph. Now, remember, in the old picture that we had, we talked about taking a limit. We also talked about given a graph on could you generate realizations? So given W, can I generally generate realizations of this Poisson process of graphs? And so here we are again, we talked about this last time. Let's say I'm born uh, with feature one. Okay, with set of features one, okay. Then um, uh, Buddy is born with set of features two. And, uh, and Lisa is born with set of features three and uh, Bin is born with set of features four, okay. We connect them, no one connected to one by time T1, but by time T2, this, person who came along seventh 
And, and look now, the one, two, three, four, these are time. This is when the points got generated. Okay, but where they are in this thing that looks like one dimension is actually very high dimensional. It's all of our latent features, okay? Things get connected. So we talked about this. So do all sampling convergence sequences converge to a graphon process? And let's not do that yet because graphons aren't big enough. Okay, and that's why we needed regularity conditions before to rule out things leaking off to, to infinity this way, leaking out into the upper right hand quadrant, which we're now going to be able to control. So I want to tell you about a different object. Okay, I have a sigma finite measure space. So I have all of us on Facebook, each specified by our whole set of features. Okay, and there's a, a measure on that. So, you know, uh, what are the odds that I would be 5.2? Well, I happen to be 5.2 and I happen to weigh 116 pounds and I happen to blah, 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 okay? Um, so mu is telling me how the features are, are appearing for the vertices. So, an integrable graph X is a triple where part of it is the graph on, part of it is uh, one variable function, which we call a star function, and part of it is a dust intensity. So this was defined, I think it should actually be Veitch and Roy, but it's Dan Roy and Victor Veitch, who was his grad student. And the norm of a graph X is defined in this way in terms of L1 norms of the, um, of the uh, two variable function W and the one variable function S. And so now instead of generating a graph on process, I'm gonna create a process that generates other kinds of stuff also from S and I. Okay, so here we go here comes me and Buddy and Ben and Lisa with our features. We're gonna be joined to each other with uh, prob you know, flipping W-weighted coins. Um, for me and Bodhi, it's the X1, X2 weighted coin. Now for each I, I'm gonna, grow a star, this is not gonna work for me, but if it's Facebook, but I'm gonna draw, grow a star of degree Poisson T times S, okay? Where, you know, I'm, I, I've got an S from this graphics. So what is that? That is, um, let's say, you know, I were Beyonce. <laughs> and there are some people who go on Facebook and they only connect to Beyonce, but to nobody else, okay? So, you know, if Beyonce were born somewhere in here, there might be some people who like only connect to Beyonce. And then independently, I'm gonna generate isolated edges at rate T squared times I. So these are, you know, pairs of people uh, who just like each other and they only connect to each other on Facebook, but to nobody else. And I'm gonna remove all isolated vertices people have connected to no one, and I'm going to output the labeled graph. So it turns out that this weird object, okay, before we learned a weird object, the graph on, now we're learning the weird object, the graph X, which is a two uh, variable function telling me about connection probabilities, a one variable function, telling me about how much star power I have. And, uh, you, you know, and a constant telling me how many pair somebody has, not me. And, and, uh, and a constant telling me, you know, how, how many couples will be on there not connected to anyone else. And the proof idea is to use Kallenberg's theorem for exchangeable random measures on time cross time to prove that this is a graph X process, okay? That that is the succinct representation.
Okay, in the context of modeling, but not convergence of sparse random graphs, Kellenberg's theorem was first used by Cronin Fox in 2014, leading to rank one, that is product function graph on processes. So <clears throat> Cronin and Fox were looking at a W that was of the form, you know, f of x, g of y. Veitch and Roy introduced this notion of a graph x and substantially generalized Corona and Fox to show that a rather generous general class of sparse graphs could be modeled by this graph x process. So if I give you a W, S, and I, what can you generate with it? Corona and Fox asked if I give you a W which has f of x and g of y, what can I model with it? Okay. Um, on my side, which was, you know, a little more the convergent side, we were trying not just to generate them, we could generate them too, but we were also trying to figure out how something could converge, how, how this could converge. So we had defined graphons, we being me, Christian Borgs, Henry Cohn, and Ian Holden, had defined graphons over arbitrary sigma finite feature spaces and studied both graphon processes generated by these graphons and the question of convergence to such graphons in a version of a cut metric corresponding to that stretching. Okay, so uh, we met Victor Veitch through hearing him and, and Dan Roy give a talk. And we said, oh, why don't you come work with us for a summer? And he did. And um, we introduced sampling convergence. We established that representation theorem. And we showed that sampling convergence is equivalent to the convergence notion for um, you know, the stretching of the underlying metric for graph sequences without too many low degree vertices. Okay, so here's how it looks, okay? We're gonna get a core of high degree vertices joined by the edges that are generated by the graph on, okay? So in there are things which are, so I'm not showing you, but along all those lines and stuff, there are things which are just internally connected. Then there are going to be high degree stars, which in addition to being connected to the internal stuff, also have some other people who connect to them without connecting to anyone else. And then a dust component of isolated edges. These are pairs of people who just want to be connected to each other, but are otherwise antisocial. Okay, so why does sampling lead to this strange limit? And what we want to do is we want to analyze this Poisson where G of E and E has M edges and vertices are kept with this strange probability. Okay, probability of course scaling like T, but then scaling it by one over square root twice the number of edges to make sure that, you know, these sparse graphs of unbounded degree can converge. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to decompose V into a core vertices of degree of order square root of n, okay, which is kind of, you know, um, these are connected to um, square root of the number of, of, of points in there. A low degree part with vertices of very low order, little o square root of n. And a high degree part of vertices, you know, going to infinity with square root of n, vertices which have degrees of order, sorry, I should have said, vertices of degrees of order like that. And I'm gonna let, and then I'm gonna sample, okay, with this probability that's up there, and CP is what's left after I've sampled C, <clears throat> LP is what's left when I've sampled L, and HP is what's left when I've sampled H. Now, H can't contain more than a little o of the number uh, of the square root of the number of edges vertices because it's used up too many of the edges 
per vertex, okay? And so there's nothing left. It's going to be empty. They were, you know, um, if a part of C contains little o square root of m vertices, okay, then it's going to be empty as well. If it contains <clears throat> theta times square root of m, okay, or theta of square root of m, but let's say theta times, okay, then once I sample, I'm going to have p times that. But if I plug in what p is, this is just theta t vertices, each of them of expected degree theta t. So I have something surviving here. We still have to deal with L. <laughs> okay. And remember, L is the stuff with degree with vertices of degree little o of m. Okay. So the question is, can I have a vertex of degree five of anything greater than than degree two coming out of L. Okay. So let's say here I am and I'm connected to, before I sample, I'm connected to, I'm, I'm, I'm L, so I don't have that many connections. I have little o square root of M connections, but I happen to have five. Okay. And so what has to happen? Well, I have. My degree, choose two, five, choose two, ways of picking out for me another pair here, okay? So let's say I pick up this pair. I have five, choose two ways of doing that. I have to be there and the vertices on each of the, and the ends of each of these edges have to be there. So that's P cubed. DI we know is scaling like square root of, of M, okay? And so this has to be because the L because the di is, is um, that, that's, that's how we normalized it. And then we know there's little o here, okay? So hence an expectation, there's nothing left here if I have, if I'm connected to five. I can only be connected to two, okay? There can only be, be, be degree two there. So after sampling, Oh, but that went to zero. <laughs> okay, so I can only have things of degree one. Okay, so all the vertices in I have degree one. Okay, they can either be stars only connected to Beyonce or me only connected to Christian Borgs and nobody else. Okay, in the limit, the edges with two vertices in there, that's like me and Christian only being connected to each other we're going to be isolated edges. Um, those between LP and CP will be, they're really, they're, they're, um, they're stars consisting of fans at the end who are so Beyonce, uh, uh, so Beyonce obsessed that they only connect to, to Beyonce. And those with both endpoints in the core CP will contribute to the graph line. Okay, let me look at the time. I'm going to give you a pre sketch of this, but then I'm going to uh, forget the next piece, which is interesting, but um, we won't do it. Okay, so, and this is just a sketch. Um, so I'm going to map this to an extremal exchangeable random measure on R squared. Okay, as we did before, and I'm going to use Kallenberg's theorem to conclude that it's a graphics process. By the way, I should tell you, when we did the next one, which was doing this for what's called a configuration model, we noticed that um, what we were doing didn't satisfy the conditions of, Kallenberg, of the Kallenberg theorem. And we were really upset and we said, what could be going wrong? And so we went in and we, and that was work with Shuvik Dara and Superbroto Sen and, Sh and Superbroto Sen. Uh, we, we noticed there was actually a counterexample to the Kallenberg representation theorem. Um, we also realized how to change the conditions because there are like these 10 conditions. Change one of the conditions so that the conclusion was still correct. We realized that here and when Veitch and Roy and when Corona and Fox had done it, 
uh, all of their still satisfied the modified condition. So we have a little note on that, like a nine page note um, saying how to modify the Kallenberg theorem to not have a counterexample. Almost surely what Kallenberg had, had imagined 20 years ago. Um, so how do we construct C? Just like before, I am born, let's say time one with my features, all my features, X, X1, okay, in the space of features, at a rate one over square root of two E, it's a Poisson process on time cross, uh, cross uh, all the points of, of the graph. I'm going to define a process by considering the points with birth time less than time t, okay? So, you know, in that thing, I looked at maybe birth time less than time four, okay? Then xt is a Poisson process of intensity p over two square root of t on, on this. And this gives a coupling of, of these, of these um, Poisson processes at different times. So I get this, this coupling. I have this random measure, but it's a coupling because as I go out, of course, it, it has to do with the projectivity of this. So as I go out, I get, you know, each process can be coupled to the next ones at different times, okay? And this measure consisting of atoms um, is, is, is gonna have a limit because of the coupling. Okay, what are properties? It's exchangeable, okay? That follows because it, the distribution is invariant under joint measure preserving transformations. This follows from the invariance of the Poisson process. Okay, this is when I take intervals and I switch and I and I permute finite intervals of time, both on the time axis here and the time axis there. Extremality is much, much harder <laughs> than it is um, in the Aldous Hoover dense graph case. Okay. Um, but it's also true. And then completion of the proof using the analog, so it's Kallenberg's theorem with that condition fixed, we obtain this random measure and hence this Poisson process of graphs can be represented in terms of a graph X, which has an, an edge generator, W of X and Y, a star generator, S of X, and a Lonely couples generator, well, not generator, constant density, I. Okay, the configuration model is a very nice model with degrees uh, where you're given degrees from the start um, and you pair these degrees. So, so each point is born with DI half edges. You connect them. Actually, life is much nicer because there's more, uh, uh, more independence. Um, we do something similar here. Um, okay, we have an empirical thing. What's kind of interesting is that this process, there's something that captures those low degree points that go out to infinity that you can actually measure here. There is a constant that captures that. And so what you get from this, it's a very nice process. It's very, um, it's very independent. So what I land up generating here is something where things connect to each other with Poisson yi, yj, because of the nice properties of the configuration model. I have loops. I have stars, which are characterized by this A, which is things that would have leaked away before. And I have isolated edges. And so I have this multi graph X. Just one more slide. No, no, I'm not gonna give you this proof sketch. Okay. Okay, in the case of, um, 
of uh, dense arrays, okay? So we had had finite dense graphs and we had permutation symmetries, okay? And when we got convergence, we got convergence to a graphon. We knew that the adjacency matrix of the graph was even of an infinite graph, um, was, um, was up to permutations, okay? Was unique only up to permutations. And the corresponding thing in graph on land was unique up to measure preserving bijections, okay? Measure preserving bijections. And so what that meant is that you basically like couldn't hide something by burying it in what would become a set of measures zero, okay? What is the non-uniqueness that we need to mod out here, okay? The arrays we modded out by permutations. The graphons we modded out by measure preserving bijections. What do you have to mod out by here? And this was the present, 110 page present, that Christian Borgs, um, Henry Cohn, Watsi Lovas Jr. and I put in the 70th year birthday volume for Watsi Lovas Sr. Um, okay. So we said given two sigma finite measure spaces um, and a measure preserving map and a graph X, okay. Okay. What is a pullback. A pullback is something where I have done this um, measure preserving map of W. So I've said, I am going to take the points, I'm going to take me and Buddy, okay, and I'm going to do a measure preserving. Uh, uh, map on our features, okay? But I, if, if it's not measure preserving, I could like bury significant features in sets of measure zero. I'm also gonna do a measure preserving map on the function S of X on the star function. Now, a graph X, you need to define the degree support of a graph X, okay? Because the, the otherwise, you can hide anything in something of zero measure because the graphon won't see it, okay? So if S of X were zero and, you know, and W of X and Y were zero, then, you know, if I, if I said anything about it, well, you, you wouldn't even see it. So, <laughs> so I don't want to, so doing a modification, there would be nobody who'd get upset because there was nothing there to begin with, okay? So the degree support are the set of people in the graph such that the star function of this person plus the, um, the integral of their connections to, to everyone else, okay? Um, is, is positive, okay? Because otherwise, of course, I can hide a set of measure zero because we're not gonna see it. And so it turns out that the following are, are equivalent. That two of these graphon processes are, um, are the same as each other in distribution, like two sequences are the same in distribution up to P, like two dense graphs are the same as each other up to measure preserving um, maps, on, uh, maps on W. If, okay, so could I just do a measure preserving bijection of one into the other? Well, first of all, I better restrict to their degree supports. And no, that's not enough. It has to be not that I can take one set of features in one measure space and transform it to another. It has to be that there's a third measure space so that I could do 
a measure preserving bijection of double of of um, of um, of omega and mu into it, and another one such that I could do a measure preserving bijection of um, of omega prime mu prime into it, but they don't need to be able to go directly. There would be counterexamples. And this was like 110 pages, so you don't want to see the proof, but um, but you have to be careful when you apply these things because if you're not careful, there could be sets of measure zero, which really mess you up. Okay. <laughs> So here today, what we saw is that, and yesterday, that for dense graphs, we have metric convergence, we have left convergence, we have right convergence, we have large deviations convergence, and so many more. For, for sparse graphs, if we rescale their heights, we get metric convergence, which is very nice, and all other notions from the dense theory except for left convergence. So there was no, and you know, one of the reasons you're not getting left convergence is that it is extremely local and uh, there's no projection here. There was no underlying process. When I rescale, I couldn't maintain the identities of the individuals. I was just saying, oh, I'm gonna take a less dense sample, okay? And the theory, the theory covers, so, so they, but they weren't in, embedded in each other. And this theory covers limits of and non-parametric models for many sparse random graphs, including sparse GMP, sparse power laws. And it also includes estimation, including private estimation. Today, we learned about sampling convergence for sparse graphs. This generalizes left convergence to sparse graphs, which we weren't able to get before. And then the models, corresponding models are graph X's consisting of graph on stars and isolated edges. And these happen to be the completion of sparse graphs under sampling convergence. And there is a representation theorem for these, similar to the aldous Hubert theorem. And finally, um, these give new non-parametric models of sparse graphs. Okay, that was a lot. Thank you for your attention. To the diehards who remained. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, it's a very interesting talk. Um, Let's see if there are any questions from the audience. If you have questions, please um, type them into the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question meanwhile. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering um, if you know about this um, alternative um, notion of exchangeability, of edge exchangeability that a couple of groups in statistics yeah. have been pursuing and Yes, um, Timur, Broderick. Yeah, and then, then Harry Stanley, and, and, uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I'm wondering um, if you could comment on, you know, your view on how they compare and when one might want to choose one over the other in real modeling situations. Right, well, I, you know, what does edge exchangeable mean, okay? It means, that, see, I, when I'm thinking of social networks or things like that, okay, you and I, Lisa, have sets of features that make us likely to connect with each other, okay? Um, w of X and Y measures how likely we are, given the fact that we both like math and we, you know, we both work on networks and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, you know, it could be that I say, oh, it doesn't matter that it's me. If there were somebody else like me, <laughs> I have my same set of features. You'd probably be, if, if I really understood all the latent features, you'd be just as likely to connect to them. I mean, it may or may not happen because you have to flip a W-weighted coin and we may or not, may or not meet each other. You know, we now happen to meet, but, um, so I understand what it means for the nodes to be exchangeable, okay? And the kind of the application I would think of there. 
for the edge to be exchangeable, I don't, I mean, I'm not thinking very much about the, that I, I'm, I'm not completely grokking the, 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 um, the application of that. Oh, uh, you know, you and I have a connection and we exchange it between me and, uh, you know, and somebody else. I mean, it could be that the edges are, okay, the likelihood of two mathematicians to, you know, but I, I, I just, I think of the features as being held more by the individuals, but there may very well be applications to which that applies. And also technically I tried to do it and I had some issues with it, but that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh -huh. it's definitely part of it is just what we have intuition about. Mm -hmm. and harder and read. So I have a, a few questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. One is from Andre Srakar. Thanks for a great talk. In terms of probability theory, do your results relate to scaling limits and the usual schramm lerner evolution scaling limit? To many processes in statistical physics, um, for example, those that Nina Holden and her colleagues research. Right, and, and Scott Sheffield and Odette Tram researched them and yeah, all of that. So um, not, not in any apparent way. I mean, those are, those are rescalings of the theories more than rescaling here. So I don't see that, although I will tell you that my training as a physicist looking at some of those kinds of things is what made us do the rescaling of the space here, but not, you know, um, there they're looking at larger and larger scales. So not absolutely uh, uh, apparently. And I, I think it's a little bit, I mean, Nina was kind of working on these two very different kinds of things when she worked with us. Um, so, okay. Um, Okay, so mixtures of clusters of exchangeable nodes. Oh, that's interesting. So I don't have, uh, yeah, so, so I don't have, so I have like, oh, maybe this group, um, you know, we could, oh, we could, we could switch this group of people at Berkeley and Columbia <laughs> or Berkeley and, you know, um, so I don't know, that's, that's interesting. I haven't thought that through uh, since Ben and I are in the same place. We can think about it and there are probably interesting applications of that as well. So yeah, I'd be happy to, that, that's an interesting question and Ben, if you want, maybe we can put a student on it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. The last question is, what is this a picture of? This is a stolen picture that I took off the web. I really should find out who did it. It's absolutely beautiful. And I loved it so much that I, I copied it and made my own um, and made my, my own slide to play out of it because like Lisa, I'm a network person and I just thought it was pretty. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? And uh, S does not need to be Riemann or Lebesgue integrable here. Okay. Um, okay. And yeah, I mean, if it's not a perfect square, so I'm looking at these questions. If, if M is not a perfect square, then, you know, in, in my last lectures, I was having like a VI divided by this plus one or something when you have to. So, so you could just do the subsequence of perfect squares, or you have to be a little fussy about the edges, but it all, but it all. Works. Yeah, there, there were a few earlier clarifying questions, Jennifer, that I think I mostly answered. Like, like. Oh, that. I see. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I didn't want to stop you, and they were more about limits. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, right. um, the 22 diehards who made it all the way through. Oh my, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this one is more technical, although it started out kind of easier with Definetti. <laughs> it got to, so hopefully 
any of you who see Definetti now realize how incredible that was, okay? And that, you know, other people asked that, Aldous Hoover asked that, and Kallenberg asked similar things, right? What, are, what is a compact representation, you know, of something in terms of something that's measurable with respect to the sigma algebra at infinity that such that you condition on that, on a random element of that, things become Bernoulli. I mean, you know, it's really an amazing question. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I this gave me much deeper appreciation of Definetti. I will tell you the truth. <laughs> very inspired, and Aldous and Hoover are very inspired. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Right. Well, so, so uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I don't know if it's up to me or body, but um, since I'm here, whatever it is, um, I think we can conclude the session now. Yes. I think so. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.